Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation, Second Harmonic Generation Detection of RAS Conformational Changes and Discovery of a Novel Small Molecule Binder, presented by Dr. Frank McCormick, Professor of the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. McCormick. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you. I'd like to describe our work to try and identify small molecules that bind to the KRAS protein using a new biophysical technique called second harmonic generation. The work that I'll be describing was done mostly by a postdoctoral fellow in my lab called Elizabeth Donahue Vaux. This summarizes the problem that we're trying to address. RAS mutations occur in a very large number of human cancers where they play a primary driving role in the development and progression of the disease. RAS mutations occur uh, most frequently in pancreas cancer where almost all pancreas cancers are caused by activation of the KRAS oncogene protein. KRAS mutations also occur in almost half of all colorectal cancers and a third of all lung cancers. There are three types of RAS protein in the cell which drive human cancer. Uh, KRAS is the most prominent, uh, shown in red on this slide. But NRAS, a cousin of KRAS, also plays an important role in leukemias and in melanoma, and HRAS, a role in bladder cancer and thyroid cancer. Altogether, these uh, RAS oncogenes play a direct causal role in over a million cancer deaths per year. And yet we have no drugs that target the RAS protein directly. And most of the drugs that we use to treat cancers are not effective on cancers in which KRAS is mutated, or NRAS or HRAS, for that matter. So this is a huge unmet clinical need. And we are determined to find molecules that bind to KRAS uh, and block its function by direct interaction. The RAS protein has been described as the beating heart of signal transduction, partly because, because the protein is heart-shaped, uh, and also because during its normal function, it, it moves back and forth between two configurations, an on state and an off state, just like a beating heart. And all growth factors uh, that, that signal through into cells signal through the RAS protein and activate the RAS protein to send signals downstream. So this is an essential part of all signal transduction and the way that all cells respond to external signals. Uh, all these signals channel through the RAS protein. In cancer cells, though, with RAS mutations, the beating heart is locked into the active state and signals downstream persistently, telling cells to proliferate even though they have no external signal. And this is one of the primary reasons that uh, they cause cancer. So the problem is really how to fix the broken uh, beating heart of signal transduction, uh, either by preventing it from signaling or uh, eliminating the whole protein altogether. It's been recognized for many years that this protein uh, does not have an active site to which small molecules can easily bind, unlike kinases, which have been successfully exploited for cancer therapy. So this protein has been deemed undruggable in the sense that uh, medicinal chemists do not see an opportunity uh, to interfere with this protein's function by simply looking for high affinity binding sites that could be blocked with a small molecule drug. Therefore, most efforts to target RAS are focused on pathways downstream of the RAS protein that RAS regulates. Now, this is a complicated slide, which we don't need to go through in any detail, except to make the point that uh, RAS proteins are part of a very complicated uh, signaling transduction network. They're right in the middle of this uh, diagram. 
So it tends to block this network by finding small molecules that bind to part targets downstream of RAS, such as RAF or MEC or ERK or PI3 kinase, have not been successful, mostly because of the complexity of the network. And because we now know when you block individual proteins in this network, then the whole network readjusts and then the cells can continue to proliferate uh, as normal. So it's a, it's a dynamic, flexible network. It's been very difficult to shut down by targeting individual proteins in the network. So this approach so far has not been successful for treating cells in which the network is perturbed by ac activated rats. So that is one problem. We have RAS drives a very complicated uh, and dynamic network. The second problem is that in, uh, if we look at the, the network between uh, different uh, cell lines derived from different tumors, we see very different dependencies on downstream elements of this network. So here's another complicated diagram, just to make a very simple point, that uh, if we look at 100 different cell lines, which is on, on the x-axis, uh, and analyze the dependence of each of these cell lines on different elements of a network that I showed previously on the y-axis. Uh, you can see if you look at uh, green, squ green squares means that particular cell line was dependent on that particular downstream element of a network. Red means the cells don't care. And you can see across the whole panel of 100 cell lines a very heterogeneous response. Some cells care about particular network components, others don't. And there's very few simple patterns that emerge by looking at a whole panel of, uh, of uh, cell lines. So there's tremendous heterogeneity in the dependence of different elements of a network, as well as the plasticity of the network itself. But this makes uh, things very complicated. If we just drill down on dependence on a few well-known uh, elements of this complicated network, such as the RAF kinase, uh, which is um, shown on this slide here on the uh, third panel uh, on the left side, bottom left. Here we show uh, the dependence of different cell lines in which uh, uh, blue are pancreatic cell lines, green are lung, and red are GI tumor derived cell lines. And the further down the slope in each case, the more dependent the cell line is on a particular protein. And you can see just, just looking at these, these simple plots, if you look at the RAF plot, which again is on the left panel, third from the top, every, the, the, the dependencies are all over the place. Some cell lines depend on RAF, others don't. And it varies very dramatically between lung, uh, pancreas, and GI tumors. Again, showing the very heterogeneous dependence of downstream elements of the network, uh, and therefore the complexity of trying to shut down the whole network with simple molecule drugs. So going downstream has not been an effective strategy for these different reasons. Therefore, we'd like to target the RAS protein directly and stop the problem at its source. A RAS protein uh, is the uh, very beautiful heart-shaped protein that I showed in the previous slide, but it has another important component, and that is that it's localized in the plasma membrane uh, through a, a tail at the C-terminal region of the protein where the protein is prenylated and the pharnacil group locks the RAS protein into the plasma membrane. So this is a, a molecular dynamic simulation of a RAS protein in the plasma membrane. The uh, light blue color is the RAS protein, again, snuggled up to the plasma membrane, which is the sort of cloud at the top of the slide. And here we show its interaction with components of a downstream network, the RAS binding domain of RAF kinase, which is in yellow, and the cysteine-rich domain of RAF kinase, which is in purple. And here you can see that RAS protein with its partner, RAF, snuggles up to the membrane in a very close uh, and intimate way. And we think that's a very important part of the signaling of the RAS protein. So some of the first attempts to target RAS way back in the uh, 1980s, some of the first attempts actually to target any uh, oncogenic protein focused on trying to prevent RAS proteins localizing to the plasma membrane. And this was uh, attempted by blocking the process of phonylation of the RAS protein. So this cartoon shows three RAS proteins, H, N, and K, all localized in the plasma membrane through a C-terminal tail, which is the black, black squiggle, and that is the pharnacil group, which is the lipid tail, which locks RAS proteins into the plasma membrane. So it's recognized in the 80s that the uh, addition of this tail to the RAS proteins is mediated by an enzyme called pharnacil transferase. And in, efforts were made to inhibit pharnacil transferase with drugs to block RAS function. 
and indeed many very potent in, uh, inhibitors of pharmaceutical transferase were developed uh, to block RAS signaling by preventing membrane localization. Un unfortunately, uh, for reasons which we didn't understand at the time, it turns out that uh, the two proteins, the two RAS proteins that play the major role in human cancer, KRAS and NRAS, can be modified by a backup system called geronal geronal transferase, which is shown in red. So when you block phosphorylation of RAS proteins, geronal geronal transferase takes over, and then the RAS proteins can go back to doing their thing, uh, causing cancer. Interestingly, HRAS does not use this backup system. So HRAS-driven tumors are actually sensitive to pharmaceutical transferase uh, inhibitors. And indeed, uh, a company called Cura uh, is now testing whether or not pharmaceutical transferase inhibitors may be effective in tumor cells which are driven by HRAS mutations. And that represents 5% of bladder cancer, about 5% of thyroid cancer, and about uh, 5 to 10% of squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. So in these, in these clinical trials, patients are selected for, patient, for their mutations in HRAS, and if they have such a mutation, they are then treated with pharmaceutical transferase inhibitor to see if they, we now block the HRAS function and have therapeutic benefit. And these studies are now in a phase three clinical study uh, for uh, hopefully proof of, uh, of effectiveness. But this drug only works on HRAS because N and KRAS have this backup system as we did, as we now appreciate. So another approach to, to blocking uh, KRAS processing uh, would be to block translation or general generation of the KRAS protein by preventing both these enzymes attacking the uh, site on the KRAS protein where these modifications take place. Uh, and that site is cysteine-185 on KRAS. So one of the projects which we are working on, uh, the Frederick National Lab, is to develop drugs which bind to the KRAS protein directly and prevent pharmacylation or general generation by actually covalently blocking the cysteine uh, on the RAS protein that would be the acceptor of these two um, modifications. And the approach that we're using is called uh, tethering, one of several approaches to targeting KRAS directly. So this approach uh, uses a library of small molecules that have cysteine reactive uh, warheads. And then we react these, uh, these little, little fragments uh, with the protein target. And if they bind to the protein close by the cysteine, uh, they form a covalent bond. Uh, and then this will block the cysteine that's under attack as shown in the cartoon here. So this we have done uh, and found several classes of warhead and compound that covalently react with the cysteine and prevent pharmacylation or general generation of the KRAS protein. And this just shows that uh, uh, in a cell line that has uh, wild type KRAS on the left panel, exposure to these compounds decreases the KRAS protein in the membrane by preventing uh, pharmacylation or general generation. On the right panel, uh, we have no effect on cells which, which are driven by a mutant form of KRAS that doesn't depend on pharmacylation for its uh, membrane localization. And I want to acknowledge the work of Anna Massiag at the Frederick National Lab for her work in developing these compounds. So this simply shows another approach to targeting KRAS, in this case by uh, preventing processing of, of KRAS uh, directly. Ideally, we'd like to find compounds that react with the mutant form of KRAS and not the wild type to give us the best uh, specificity uh, for um, effectiveness without uh, effects on normal tissue. This seemed um, impossible many years ago, but uh, recently my colleague at UCSF, Kayvan Shokat, developed an idea that is now developed into clinical uh, compounds in which chemicals are developed that interact covalently with the uh, G12C mutation that is frequently mutated in, in human lung cancer. So normally there's a glycine at codon 12, but a mutation occurs in that residue to, to convert it to a cysteine residue, which then locks the RAS protein into the, um, into the uh, active state and causes cancer. But the cysteine residue itself can be attacked by covalent modifications using, using the tethering chemistry that I just described in the previous slides. The G12C mutations, therefore, are vulnerable to chemical attack. And they occur frequently in non-small cell lung cancer, as shown in the pie chart on the bottom right. But the red sector is the fraction of non-small cell lung cancers 
in which G12C is the major driver of the tumor. G12C mutations are frequent in this form of lung cancer because they are the hallmarks of exposure to cigarette smoke. You'll see in pancreatic cancer and in colorectal cancer, the red sector is much smaller, showing that G12C mutations are much less frequent in these cancers. In, uh, in these cancers, G12D, the spartate mutation of colon 12, is the most frequent mutation that causes these cancers. Uh, and this would be another uh, target for attack if we could think of a way of developing chemicals that attack such a residue, but so far we have not. Now, in, in terms of compounds that uh, bind directly to, to uh, RAS proteins and inhibit them, uh, one such compound is the compound that I just described that attacks the cysteine, the compound ARS1620, and this shows where that compound binds on the uh, RAS protein. I'm also showing in the top box another compound that binds to RAS uh, that was discovered by another technique called NMR-based fragment screening. This approach was developed uh, by Steve Fessick and colleagues uh, at, um, at Abbott Biolabs uh, and has been utilized by his group now at Vanderbilt and also by the group of Genentech uh, to find small molecules that bind to RAS and other targets. And the approach here is to uh, take a soluble form of RAS, expose it to a small fragment, such as the one in a little box, and if the, if the compound binds to the RAS protein, you see a shift on the NMR spectrum. And this tells you that you have a binding compound. And this compound that I've highlighted here was identified using that particular approach. So NMR-based uh, fragment design is another approach to finding small molecules that bind to RAS. And other approaches have yielded compounds that also bind to RAS. So this is another compound. This is from the group of Terry Rabbits in the UK uh, that um, identified a compound that displaces the RAS binding region of RAS from, RAS from RAS itself by competing at the binding site. So these are small molecule fragments that bind to uh, shallow pockets on the RAS protein, and they bind with rather low affinity, again stressing that the RAS proteins don't have deep pockets to which molecules can bind. Uh, so these are examples of uh, uh, molecules that could further be developed to make them more, uh, more potent, but in the current state are low affinity, weak interactors at these sites. The group of Frederick National Lab has solved a number of crystal structures of uh, KRAS proteins in the hope that uh, they will reveal new structures uh, that have pockets to which small molecules could bind at high affinity. And uh, such uh, structures are shown. These six examples are six um, mutant proteins, RAS proteins that occur in human cancers at high frequency. From left to right, top to bottom, G12C, G12D, G12V, G13D, Q61L, and Q61R. Now, in these diagrams, the uh, blue segments, which are at the top of the structures, are the part of the protein called switch one. Switch one is where RAF kinase binds to RAS. So any compound that, dis that uh, disrupted or, or changed the structure at switch one is likely to affect RAF binding. Now the crystal structures of these proteins show that three of these proteins, that is G12C on the top line, G12D below it, and Q61L uh, in the middle of the bottom line, you can see that the blue region at the top of the protein is actually in a different state than the wild type protein on the left or the other mutants, G12D, G12V, and Q61R. So for these three particular mutant proteins, the switch one region is in a state that is actually open, presenting a new pocket to which a small molecule could potentially bind and hold the protein in the active switch one out configuration, which would be incapable of binding uh, to RAS. To RAF, I'm sorry. So uh, based on these structures, we believe that uh, we have a potential new approach to finding molecules that could disrupt these particular mutants uh, selectively by binding in these pockets. So these are different approaches uh, that, uh, that have been used successfully, uh, NMR-based fragment design and covalent tethering to find molecules that bind to RAS and really uh, uh, make up for the fact that there aren't deep pockets to which a molecule can bind and therefore we have to use uh, either covalent approaches or uh, NMR-based approaches to find compounds that interact. 
NMR-based fragment design is effective, but requires very high concentrations of protein uh, and uh, very expensive and, diff and difficult technology to actually uh, conduct high throughput screens uh, with this uh, as the primary readout. So a new technology has been developed uh, recently uh, by um, Josh Salaski and his colleagues then at uh, Biodicy, uh, which utilizes a different biophysical uh, feature of proteins that enables one to identify molecules that bind to the protein in a high throughput screening format with a very small amount of protein and with very high sensitivity. So the, the, tech, the optical phenomenon is called second harmonic generation. And the way that it works is that uh, an incident light coming in uh, to a, uh, a membrane that's shown uh, on the left panel here uh, and reflected again using uh, typical turf microscopy principles emits a secondary wave in the z-axis as shown by that black arrow. Now, uh, if we put a protein onto this membrane uh, and the protein has a dye attached to the protein that is a particular chemical nature, a resonance will occur that sends a signal called a second harmonic uh, signal. Typically, two red photons combine to give a blue photon as part of the, uh, the second harmonic uh, signal. And this resonance occurs between the emitted the, uh, the uh, blue photon and the dye on the protein. And when a small molecule binds to the protein, as shown in the middle panel, a green blob here uh, binds to the a little pocket on the protein, the protein changes in configuration and this changes the, uh, the resonance between the, uh, the photons that are, that are impinging on the protein and the second harmonic wave. And the important point here is that a very small change in the angle of the protein on, on the membrane gives a very significant change in the second harmonic signal. So a one degree change in the orientation of the protein relative to the membrane gives a very powerful uh, signal uh, which can be easily detected uh, using the uh, uh, detectors of the second harmonic wave. So this allows us to see very small changes uh, in protein configuration, such as those typical of allosteric uh, binding events to a, to a protein, and enables us to screen for compounds that bind to a protein using this as a simple readout, using uh, rather standard techniques. Uh, the protein can be mobilized on the membrane using a, um, a epitope tag on the protein, such as the histidine tag, uh, which will bind to uh, nickel in the uh, bilayer, or the protein can, have, can utilize its, its own tethering mechanism, such as the Farnesol group in the case of RAS, to bind to a, a synthetic bilayer to stick it into the uh, membrane. And once the protein is in that configuration, then small changes in its, uh, in its orientation relative to the membrane can be detected by second harmonic generation. Now, to make the protein uh, SHG active, uh, one has to conjugate the protein with a particular dye uh, to create an SHG uh, re reactive moiety on the protein. And, to, and with RAS, we've done that uh, by reacting a chemical dye with, uh, with lysines on the, on the protein. But it can also be done by reacting chemical dyes with cysteines or even including in the protein a nucleotide that has an SHG reactive side group. So in this case, we reacted the uh, KRAS protein with a chemical that reacts with, it, with lysines at approximately one molecule uh, of adduct per protein. And we mapped the site of binding by uh, mass spec. And we see that uh, in the inactive form on the left panel, most of the binding is at lysine 88, 90% of it. And in the GTP bound form on the right side, uh, we see covalent uh, reaction of the uh, dye at lysine 128 and a little bit at uh, lysine 104. So after this chemical reaction, the protein is now SHG active, and we can then immobilize this on the membrane via the high uh, frequency uh, red laser beam at the protein on the membrane, and then see a second harmonic wave, uh, which can be then uh, measured, and then we can look for perturbations of the wave as a measurement of protein binding, a uh, small molecule binding. Sorry. So as part of a development process, so we'd like to have a, a, a positive control. Uh, and um, one example is uh, a, a chemical called uh, uh, mepazine, which is a nonspecific uh, chemical which reacts with many different proteins and protein kinases in a nonspecific way, but at least gives us a positive signal uh, to uh, set up the assay development. Uh, I should say that when we started these experiments, there were no positive controls of compounds that bind 
harassed at high affinity or even moderate affinity to use as positive controls. Uh, so we used uh, uh, the um, mezzanine as a uh, uh, sorry mepazine as a positive control. And you can see on the left panel, we see in a dose-dependent manner, when we add increasing amounts of mepazine to the immobilized RAS, we see a change in the SHG signal. Now, the SHG signal can either be negative or positive, depending on whether or not the change in the protein moves the protein uh, away from the uh, z-axis or toward the z-axis. So we can see conformational changes in both directions. In this case, the mepazine causes a negative uh, SHG signal. And the middle panel shows that we see the same kind of signal, whether the protein is bound to GDP uh, or uh, to GTP. Let's skip the next one. And these are the kind of results we see. So each of these plots here is a, uh, a dose-dependent increase in concentration of a small molecule that causes an SHG change in uh, the protein when it, in the RAS protein when it interacts. And you can see that uh, almost all the compounds that interact with RAS cause the same type of uh, allosteric change in the same direction, with a few exceptions which stand out. Obviously, some go in the, uh, the opposite direction, as you can see from uh, the, the panel, which is uh, six uh, uh, boxes from the left and down one slide. You can see that the, uh, here the compound actually causes a change in orientation of the protein in the opposite direction. And you can see in the bottom panel also some examples of confirmational changes which are in the opposite direction. So these are very nice uh, dose-dependent uh, responses showing allosteric changes in RAS on compound binding. And again, you can see different types of binding depending on the different compound. And these are just more, more examples of uh, relatively high affinity uh, binding, uh, which show, again, nice uh, dose-dependent response curves uh, and uh, uh, mostly in one direction, but some also in, in the other direction, showing some selectivity. Now, we've replicated these, uh, these binding events from a whole library of uh, thousands of compounds uh, done at uh, different concentrations. And you can see from the replication of these, uh, these uh, analyses that we see a very good uh, R-squared value, uh, showing that the, the uh, assay itself is very reproducible uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, data of very high quality. So these assays can be run uh, on the Delta machine that Biodicy has manufactured uh, in high-throughput uh, format. So we can run literally thousands of compounds in a, in a few hours uh, and go through libraries of chemical, uh, compounds looking for the most, uh, most effective binders. And then we can follow up with these compounds, again, uh, doing dose response curves and looking for uh, the effects of these compounds at, uh, at different concentrations. And here we see uh, compounds that bind to the RAS protein in the active uh, GTP bound configuration at two different concentrations, or in the GDP uh, configuration on the right side. And this distribution shows us where most of the compounds fall with respect to the standard deviation around the, uh, the center of the, the plot on each of the graphs here. So the next step is to um, really validate the uh, direct interaction of the compounds with the uh, with RAS proteins uh, using either SPR, a surface plasma resonance, uh, or by uh, mass spec or other biophysical uh, methods that independently interact uh, measure binding. And th these we've done in this case at, uh, at the group uh, by the group at Frederick Maryland under the, under the supervision of uh, Andy Steven. Uh, again, uh, we can show that uh, the, the very high affinity binders or the higher affinity binders from the screen uh, have very, uh, we can select those from the dose response curve, uh, they're reproducible, and these have moved forward for further uh, characterization. So this shows the next steps in the, in the process, essentially. Uh, this is an, uh, an NMR spectrum, which was actually performed at the University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, this shows that in the presence of the compound, we see uh, shifts on the uh, on the NMR spectrum. In this case, they're modest but still reproducible, uh, and they're dose dependent, as shown on the right-hand panel. So, although this is a much more laborious and complicated technique, we can verify that these compounds do indeed bind directly to RAS and get an indication of where they, whereabouts they bind based on the shifts uh, on the NMR spectrum. On the lower panel, you can see the, the plots that we obtained using. Uh, the uh, SPR analysis, the surface plasma resonance, another biophysical method for determining uh, the direct interaction of a small molecule uh, with a protein. And you can see uh, these are dose-dependent SPR plots, 
Uh, they don't look very pretty because the binding constants of these compounds are still uh, rather low in the you know, 100 micromolar plus range. But this makes the point that these, uh, these fragments, although they bind very cleanly, as shown by the NMR spectrum, um, with some selectivity, the binding is not sufficiently strong to, to make them easily detectable using conventional biophysical methods such as uh, SPR. So we think that the SHG approach is actually much more sensitive uh, and enables us to do a much higher throughput analyses. Again, these are more, uh, these are, uh, more examples of spectra that bind uh, to, uh, from the NMR spectra on the top left. And in this particular case, the compound uh, shows differential binding between the GTP form and the GDP form of the, of the RAS protein, which is uh, a desirable feature. And again, you can see from the um, SPR plots at the bottom that um, we can see clear evidence of binding, uh, but uh, these, are very not, these are not very strong SPR signals that would have been difficult to detect uh, as primary screens. Uh, furthermore, we've analyzed other tool compounds that bind to RAS proteins with low affinity. And typically with SPR, uh, we have a, the, the problem that if a compound binds at more than one site, uh, the SPR signals never become saturated. And therefore, you don't measure a binding constant, and you can't feel assured that the compound is actually binding uh, selectively. Whereas with the SHG method, we do see saturation of conformational changes uh, by compounds binding locally to the protein, uh, which we believe more likely corresponds to local changes in the RAS protein structure, which uh, the SGH, sorry, the SHG signal uh, reflects uh, very nicely, as do the uh, NMR spectra. So we think this is a, a better technique than, than uh, SPR for, so, for sure, and also much more practical and convenient than using fragment-based uh, NMR as a primary screen. Now, this shows, um, based on the, um, the NMR spectra, uh, the pocket to which we think these small fragments bind, based on the shifts we see in the, uh, in the NMR spectra. And we can see that we can bind uh, very nicely to a pocket, which is uh, close to a pocket previously identified by Steve Fessick and colleagues and by the group at Genentech. Uh, as a pocket uh, which is suitable for a small molecule interaction, at least with a, a low affinity in a sort of shallow, shallow group. So uh, to summarize, uh, we think SHG is a, a novel and uh, useful way of screening for compounds that bind to uh, proteins of interest. Uh, these screens can be done at high throughput with small amounts of target protein. Uh, the protein only has to be immobilized on a surface which can be achieved using a simple epitope tag. Uh, we also now know that protein complexes can be assembled on these, um, on these membranes, uh, and uh, then we can detect signals from SHG even on relatively large and complicated uh, protein complexes, because really all we're looking at is the change in orientation between a single dye covalently uh, attached to one of the proteins and the, uh, the membrane to which the protein is attached. That's the basis of SHG, so it's a, it's a very robust and simple technique. Following hits from these screens, then uh, it's necessary to go to the next step, which is um, typically independent biophysical analysis using SPR, if possible, NMR, hopefully X-ray crystallography, biochemical screens. Uh, and uh, typically, the next step involves medicinal chemistry to improve the initial hits to make them into high affinity compounds, which could be the beginning of the whole process of, uh, of developing bioactive compounds. So with that, I'll like to, to wrap up and uh, again acknowledge the work of Elizabeth uh, Donahue Vo in my lab that did the uh, most of the work here in collaboration with uh, colleagues uh, Josh Salaski uh, and friends at, uh, at, at Biodicy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McCormick, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Now, before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time. Goodbye.